All right, here we go again, my wonderful and marvelous people. I think I might do a word of the day. The word of the day is portmanteau. That's when you take two words and put them together to make them one, like Angelina and Brad Brangelina. Swonderful, sweet, wonderful people. Smarvelous, smart and marvelous. Portmanteau. All right, I'm gonna probably do that for the next three or four uh, videos. I'm gonna give you a word of the day. The next word's gonna be stridulate, stridulate. We'll use that in a second. I watch a lot of Frasier. Okay, um, back to the matter at hand. Today we're going to do shoulder, very simple shoulder routine. Just got off of cardio, just so you're aware. Eight miles today, I'm a little fatigued. But what if you have limited equipment at your house but need to get a shoulder workout that will be challenging enough that the muscles will actually grow and get a, a fully functional stimulus, the one thing that I would recommend that you do, take notes. I'm gonna be very clear and very deliberate. I'm gonna have you do shoulder presses without a back support. You can either do them standing or sitting on a stability ball. The idea is that you have to functionally tie your own posture in through the core, draw the belly button toward the spine to activate the transverses abdominis and the multifidus and the pelvic floor region to help you stabilize at the, uh, at the thoracic lumbar fascia area. While we do shoulder press, overhead shoulder press, I'm going to do them off the ball and we're going to use a lot of proper rhythm techniques to make sure that we are engaging the core, I'm keeping it mad simple, and just pressing overhead. All right, so that's what we got coming up, so stay tuned. If you don't have a ball, just do it standing up. You get core involvement. That's when you see a dope dude like Mike Rashid doing a standing shoulder presses, trust me. Unbelievably good move for many people. All right, that's what we got coming up next. Get your shoulder press material. I'll be right back. All right, we well, are doing shoulders. I'm sitting on a stability ball. I typically have a hard time building shoulders. I didn't spend a great deal of time in my early training career building up shoulders. And unfortunately, I was in a car accident uh, that really messed my shoulders up. So I had to get that strength back. Uh, so I did more functional exercise instead of uh, bodybuilding, which shapes the shoulders better. So we are going to do uh, some light shoulder presses or moderate. So if you have a moderate weight that's challenging but doable, make sure you get it. That's the two words that you want to you have them challenging. All right. I'm sitting up tall. Chest is up. I'm going to bring them up to the delt. Ears and down. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We'll take a breather. One bad. I'll probably cut in some information uh, in between sets. And actually, doing this video on shoulders reminds me of when I was getting my uh, certification as a medical exercise specialist under the American Academy of Health, Fitness, and Rehabilitation Professionals. That was Dr. Michael Jones. Dr. Michael Jones was brilliant. I remember when I was trying to uh, get a gig at a big, beautiful facility in Manhattan at 40 Rock, 40 Rockefeller. I'm not going to say the name of it, but this big facility has the same name as a, a kind of a popular sneaker or was popular back in the day, and then reemerged. I remember having to take a stupid test that this company, that this this particular uh, gym wanted me to take, and it asked the three joints of the shoulder, and I was like, yikes, I have to go in to a big, beautiful facility knowing that there are actually four joints of the shoulder, which are the acromioclavicular, sternoclavicular, glenohumeral, and scapulothoracic. I have to know all of that knowledge that I'm gaining from a superior professional that I'm spending thousands of dollars to get my certification. I have to learn bad information 
because the gatekeepers at these beautiful gyms are, are the ones with information that counts, which is really bad information. Here it is, I'm uh, studying for hours, 40, 50 hours at a time, taking copious notes. This man gave so much study material, so much lecture material, so much personal time to learn from him, and uh, a bunch of dunderheads get to tell you uh, what what is in order to get into their club. So I say that to a lot of new fitness professionals, take your craft serious, learn as much as you can, and if you don't get in with the quote-unquote cool kids, don't feel bad. Just know that you are the best at what you do, and eventually it will all work out for you. Never dumb yourself down to be a part of the crowd, period. All right, here we go, set number two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. These are only 35 pounds. And if I were on a bench with back support, I could do 70 to 80 pounds easily for 10 to 15 reps, easily. So the stability ball really humbles you, takes a lot of support, which you're getting force stabilization from the back of the bench, force stabilization from the bottom. So that stability that a bench provides will help you line up and execute the movement more. Now this is kind of like trying to shoot a cannon out of a robo, okay? There is no stabilization, so you have to forcefully create stabilization, which in turn is going to make you struggle to do the weight, which in turn stimulates more muscle. And my man Lee Haney says, stimulate, don't annihilate. So this is why this is important. And I have to say for the record, as amazing as Michael Jones was at the American Academy of Health, Fitness, and Rehabilitation Professionals, and my medical exercise certification was for me, I was able to dig even deeper with scientific shoulder training by Paul Check. I mean, we really got into the weeds specifically on the shoulders. We're talking about hundreds of pages and hours of at least five hours of lecture on the shoulder alone, you know, how to do strength training, not rehabilitation, but more strength and conditioning for app. So this is why this is important. Oh, I might as well be looked in 70s, but these are 35s. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, set three in the books. I've got two more sets. Ooh, yeah, so when I do many of these videos, I try to keep the information and the execution very simple. It's the simple things that will get you really, really good results, but it's quality and consistency. You have to be able to do the simple things like line up the muscle against the resistance properly, be establishing where gravity is coming from and forcefully fight against gravity and understand the dynamic relationship between flexion and extension and which muscles are primarily activated and basically stay within that path of motion in order to accomplish the exercise. So that means good form. It means I can't press the weight in front of me. I need to maintain an overhead uh, and strong uh, fortitude about my prowess when it comes to maintaining good posture and structure. I'm going to go for set four now. Ah, here we go. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, ten, eleven. Right. I can tell you for a fact, 
Most bodybuilders don't like to lock out on this because they feel like it puts more pressure on the triceps in the lockout, which it does. The triceps become a secondary muscle um, during this, uh, this, this particular movement, the overhead shoulder press. But I've always had like a problem with that piece of advice just for the fact that you're not really holding that lockout long. And when you're pushed all the way up to a locked out position, it's not like the deltoids are getting rest. The deltoids are still under uh, stress. It's just to what degree? Uh, high enough degree that it's going to stimulate muscle growth. I do have something stuck in my throat, a motorcycle, apparently. Um, I, uh, I do understand why people keep dynamic tension pumping and pumping uh, it, at, at the level that a bodybuilder is in their development by the time they hit the stage on the national, or junior national, and professional level. They have done all of these basic exercises at nauseum, and then they need to stimulate the muscle in a very different way. So changing the movement pattern is more helpful to me than the idea that locking out is bad. I don't think locking out is bad. I just think that if you've been locking out for the first five years of your training and you're going to that next level, don't lock out. Do the pumping action. Uh, it's a different uh, stimulus to the muscle. The body's not used to it. It's called unaccustomed stimulus. And I think the body reacts when you do something different, just as long as it's safe. And that is what they're doing is safe. So that's my take on it. Uh, I, I'm just coming from the uh, perspective of a person who loves the sport and uh, who's very, 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 very qualified to talk about these things. Uh, we'll go over that in one video. Uh, I've been doing this since 1995, guys, and I ain't been doing it with a uh, certification from a bubblegum rapper. I've, I've gone after them all. One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. All right, five sets, and that is a nice hit. So if you haven't done this, you just watch this, and you need to go back, try it. Please go back, try it. This is very good for you. Very simple. The idea is I want to make life very easy for you in order for you to get a good workout. Our next workout, I think I'm going to focus on ways to develop, or one specific way to develop the lat without doing pull-ups, and that will be with the one-arm row. So that'll be our next video. Until then, study this, try it a couple times, learn it, and maybe you add in some push-ups uh, as a part of the workout to, you know, expand it from 10 minutes to 20 minutes. All right, I'll catch you guys next time. And guys, just so you're aware, just because I geek out on all of the scientific information that I get from some of my favorite strength and conditioning coaches, this type of stuff helps me stay sharp, debate, help people that need uh, real help beyond bodybuilding uh, to get me to really stay on my P's and Q's with the deep, science aspect of it, the simple stuff. I'm also an old school bodybuilding fan, right? I'm a part, I love the old um, bodybuilding information that I've been getting since the 80s. So um, this is where my love of training first came from. It first came from the world of bodybuilding, uh, obviously sports. And to tell you the God's honest truth, the, the one person I wanted to be like mostly was her dad, Muhammad Ali. I wanted to look like Muhammad Ali when I was a little kid, and then I started seeing people like Tony Atlas and, and Rocky Johnson, The Rock's father, and I'm like, dang, I really want to look like that. And uh, then I want to perform like Bo Jackson. So it was bodybuilding, football, and other kinds of sports that got me into the door of, of personal training back in 1995. But the science really got me, and the, and the reason why I, I really latched on to Paul Check is because I was researching one day. I said, who is helping Michael Jordan? 
and Paul Check's name came up. And from there, I think that was like 1999, I really got deep. So I really switched focus and got more into functional fitness.